Now we've got the first Gen Z member of Congress, Maxwell Alejandro Frost. Thanks so much for taking the time. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start in your home state of Florida. Ron DeSantis's Department of Education will now teach students that some black people benefited from slavery because it taught them useful skills. Now, as a Floridian, as a former public school student, and as a person of color, what's your reaction to this move? I mean, it, it it really showcases what we've been trying to say for years here in the state of Florida. This governor and his entire apparatus, not only do they want to erase history and specifically black history, which is American history, but they want to rewrite it. And they want to write it in a way that almost kind of gives a pass and praise to white supremacy because they want to change the way future generations think about the world and think about what white supremacy is because it is so important to their far right wing fascist movement. And that is what's going on here in the state of Florida there. They saw that last year in the midterms, Gen Z, over 70 percent of us vote Democrats because we want action on the climate crisis, gun violence and water rights protected. The right wing, they're wising up to it. And now they're, they want to change schooling so they can change the generation. But I think little do they know and that they'll come to find out um, it's not doing anything to help them. It's actually just pissing young people off. Well, that's the thing. Like if this is a if this is a 15 year strategy, uh, isn't that going to isn't that going to redound like to their to their disadvantage in the 15 years until that actually bears itself out? Like people are in school right now. They can recognize what's happening. People in your generation, people who are students in high school right now, they all know the truth. And so isn't this just pissing them off more than it's more than it's going to help them 15 years down the line when this actually bears itself out? A hundred and ten percent. You know, like one of the things that the Republican Party has done a good job of is creating long term plans and waiting and seeing them out to fruition. Right. We saw it happen with abortion rights. We saw it happen with the state legislatures. And I think as Democrats, we have something to learn there on long term planning. However, when it comes down to young voters, um, they will use that plan. Right. Well, let's make a long term plan to change young people in this country. But what they don't understand is we're, we're, we're pretty impatient as a generation <laughs> for better or for worse. Right. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. It's not good. But um, I think part of what that creates is a situation where we're going to want to see a lot of change in a small amount of time, which I agree with. We need transformational change in this country. However, as they begin to implement this long term plan to change the way an entire generation thinks by changing their schooling, I think it's really going to backfire because they've never dealt with Gen Z before. Right. In this way. And I think they're going to really find out. And, the, and it's not just Gen Z. It's young millennials. Um, it's the future generations coming after Gen Z. More and more, these younger uh, generations are becoming more and more progressive and they're staying progressive throughout their life. Um, and I think it's really going to change politics in this country. We as Democrats have to ensure that we're ready for it. You know, the strength of a movement isn't when it's in TV or when everyone cares. It's when no one cares when it's talking about it. What are you doing on the ground? And that's how you build. So when you have these peak moments and sometimes the peak moments are unfortunate moments, right? You have things like shootings that happen that bring people into a movement. You have the trauma that happens that bring two people to, brings people into a movement, but then also you have hope. And when those things are there, um, what are we gonna do to give young people a political home? We can't take it for granted. Ron DeSantis has also floated the idea of suing Bud Light. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but the general rule of thumb with DeSantis is something, something too woke. Uh, is that what's finally gonna save his flailing presidential campaign, do you think? You know, I don't know what it's what's going to save. It looks like he's had about I think it's three or four, uh, you know, new starts or reboots to the campaign. So, I mean, maybe when we're on the eighth reboot, we'll, he'll be suing, uh, you know, some other company. And here's the thing. I don't have problems with our leaders going after corporations for the right reasons. Right. But these aren't the right reasons. He's going after people because they're showing solidarity with a protected class or queer community or LGBTQ plus community, which is horrible in and of itself. But I want to take a step back. It's not just, oh, I disagree with him because he's a Republican. He's an authoritarian figure abusing his power to subvert democracy, to consolidate power. There's a word for that. It's, it's fascism. I'm glad more people are talking about it because it's important. I'm not trying to fear monger. It's not hyperbole. I'm just trying to define because it's scary. It is scary. And look, even though things look grim for DeSantis right now in this race, he'll be back. Right. And it's, and maybe it won't be him. Maybe it's a different iteration of Donald Trump around DeSantis. And so we have to pay cl close attention to this and not be scared and run away, but amp up our organizing to fight against it. But whether it's Bud Light or Disney or whatever is next, you know, I think what DeSantis and what the right wing, what they benefit from. And they've done this forever. 
creating a situation that doesn't exist, crowning themselves the protagonist or the hero in the story, and then telling their voters, give me more power and I'll deal with it. It used to be gay marriage. Now it's like taboo to kind of speak against that because we've evolved as as a country. So now they're, you know, they wanted to find other ways to get to it. Now it's trans people and bathrooms and trans existence in general. So they're bringing up this issue that really no one talks about as far as bathrooms are concerned. And he's saying, yeah, yeah, let me deal with this horrible issue. Your kids are at risk. And if you give me the power, I'll do it. And we see he's doing a lot more with the power than handling the issues that he's created. Yeah, these Republicans always need to find boogeymen. They've done it for generations, yep. and they will continue doing it right now. Um, exactly. We'll move over to uh, to the issue of climate change. AAA and farmers um, have pulled out of Florida and won't offer coverage in the state. That's how dire the climate situation has become. Is there any acknowledgement from your Republican colleagues that pretending climate change wasn't real was a terrible move? Because massive insurance companies don't make decisions to pander. They're not being activists. They're just yeah. doing it because it's no longer profitable. They only think in dollars and cents. They don't care about the politics. They care about the money. 110 percent. 110 percent. And I haven't seen any, uh, you know, changing of the Republican Party. And when I say Republican Party, I'm talking about the leaders on the climate crisis. They're going to continue to find ways to not admit fault. Right. That's like the first thing they can never admit fault um, because it really hits their credibility. And so they'll find other ways to talk about these issues that are going on. And you're 100 percent right. It's interesting. You know, corporations have really been and are some of the worst actors as far as the climate crisis is concerned. But at the end of the day, they're they're protecting the bottom line. And if it looks like because of the climate crisis that it doesn't make sense to insure people in a state because they're making less money, they're going to leave and they won't you know, care about the people left behind. And unfortunately, we have leaders who won't connect those dots. Right. He's not going to connect those dots. He called them woke. He told the uh, people of our state, you know, because there were questions, what are we going to do? Hurricane season's coming up. We just had Hurricane Ian last year that decimated like two cities. So what's the plan? And you know what he said? He said, knock on wood, there isn't a hurricane. And then he called the companies woke and he moved on uh, because he's running for president. And that's the leadership we have in the state. And again, it's not this isn't about, oh, I don't like him because he's a Republican. I mean, we can have that conversation, too. But it's about he's not even being a leader. Right. He's not even doing what we need to do to get ready for these storms coming up. And actually, these storms have always been a place of bipartisanship, at least in our state, right? No matter what the storm is, you always saw Democrats and Republicans coming together to figure out how do we prepare for it and how do we handle the repercussions after. Unfortunately, he doesn't even want to work with anyone on that alone. So yes, knock on wood, there isn't a storm because our leaders aren't doing anything about it. We're doing what we can in Congress. We're, you know, uh, we're going to be knocking doors, uh, doing hurricane preparedness canvases and doing what we can. But let's be clear, the governor of this state, it the buck stops with him on hurricane preparedness. He has resources at his disposal and he's not doing anything about it. You know, I would imagine uh, moving over to yet another issue, I would imagine that a big part of the reason that Republicans in Congress don't feel any pressure to pass gun safety legislation is because they're surrounded by people uh, who haven't been in school in decades. So do you think that your being in Congress and other young representatives being there will have any impact? Like that they'll have to look at people like you in the face and still have to vote against this stuff? Or am I just imbuing them with a sense of humanity that they just don't have? You know, um, yes, yes and no. The yes part is yes. I mean, having younger people in Congress, changing the composition of Congress is a good thing. Right. And um, and it is because we get to speak with our colleagues, even though the no part is I, I don't think that them looking us in the face or is you know going to change their vote. Um, their mind is on their reelection. Their mind is on the pressure they'll get from their party. You know, some of them lack humanity. Some of them are just cowards. Some of them don't care. And so, you know, it's it's different for everyone. Um, so I don't think them looking at us in the face is going to change that. I mean, the reason I say that is because, you know, I come from the gun violence movement. And so for me, if the murder of people in schools, children in schools doesn't change the way you think about a situation, right. what will? I, yeah. What, what what will? And so that's why I'm actually pretty heavy on, you know, elections and, and giving us the opportunity to change what Congress looks like. Um, I, I'm all about changing the hearts and minds of our of the politicians once they get in office. But I find it a hell of a lot easier 
to just, you know, work to kick them out yep. So, yep. Uh, and, and get better people in there. And that's what we need. You know, I was just speaking to a group of young people about Congress and someone had brought up, it seems like it's hard to change things. It's like impossible. It's so out of reach. And I was telling them about how we vote and you know how we vote. We have a card and we walk up to this machine. It's behind every seat. We put the card in there. We click yes, no, or present. And sometimes when I'm voting, I'll just look around and I'll look at the board and say, wow, you know, 10, 10 more buttons and we save, you know, DEI in schools, you know, 50 less buttons and we could have stopped this horrible thing from happening, you know, 80 more buttons and everyone has health care. And I love thinking about it that way because that's what it is. It's people pressing buttons that impact our life. And I feel like when you bring it down to that level, I can do something about that. You know what I mean? We can do something about changing the people who represent us. And so I always try to bring it down for people. It seems out of reach and in a lot of ways it is, um, but we do have a great opportunity um, to change it. And it's going to take time, but I'm here for it. We've endured some really far right houses and and to think of the difference between some of these houses that we've had in the very recent past versus yeah. the Congress that we just had in the Democratic controlled Congress where we passed the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act and the PACT Act and the CHIPS Act and the gun yeah. safety bill and the infrastructure package. I mean, it, it, when you realize what we can do just with, you know, one or two elections time, it really does kind of put this into perspective that a lot of this stuff is super achievable. And it is just a matter of finding, you know, switching out a, a, a few people here and just yeah. a, a few buttons to your point and uh, and we can accomplish yeah. a lot. So yeah, um, 100%. We are recording this on Friday. As of this recording, Trump has not yet been indicted in the January 6th case, but we expect that it could happen any day now, um, if not by the time people are actually watching this and listening to this. Can I have your reaction to what would be Trump's third indictment and the fact that your colleagues are still falling over themselves to defend the guy? I mean, he's making history, <laughs> the, bad, the bad kind of history. Um, you know, I'll say I don't have much to comment on, on this besides like, let's, you know, see how the legal system plays out. Um, it is important that when people break the law, they're held accountable. And especially with our leaders, you know, our country has a long history of criminalizing people because of the color of their skin or how much money they have in the bank and a long history of rich white men getting away with it. And um, when you look at someone who did incite an almost insurrection on our nation's capital, there has to be accountability or else it gives a pass to the future. Um, and it gives a pass to the future people who might want to do a similar thing. And because the far right wing, uh, you know, neo-fascist movement is growing so quickly in this country, we need to do everything we can to stop it. Accountability is part of that. So we'll, you know, re re you know, respect the system there and we'll see how it plays out. It's incredibly sad. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, you know, you shouldn't be popping up to defend someone who blatantly broke the law and challenged the integrity of our country. Um you know, you, we need to stand together as a country here and do what's right for the people, not what's right for the party. You know, is there any acknowledgement, maybe behind the scenes from these Republicans, that they are sticking their necks out for a guy on arguably one of the least popular issues there is? I mean, January 6th doesn't exactly pull yeah. well. So is there any recognition that they're basically tying themselves to someone who will likely be a four-time convicted felon by the time the election actually rolls around? I think it shows that the Republican Party is in deep trouble. Um, you know, they are being completely taken over by, again, the far right neo fascist, uh, you know, part of their party. What, what You know, maybe it makes up 30 to 40 percent of the party of the true believers. But, it, you know, that number almost doesn't matter because when the other, you know, 50, 60 percent enable it, it's just as bad. And that's what's going on in Congress right now. There are moderate Republicans in Congress, but you wouldn't know it if you look at the voting because they're voting the same way as the Freedom Caucus because they're you know either scared or they don't care or whatever. It's a different reason for everybody. And uh, I think it's important to know that. And we're seeing the same thing with the Republican Party. You have some people sticking their neck out. I have respect for people who you know walk the different direction from the rest of the crowd. Uh, any all those all the people running for president on the Republican side, by the way, are not good people who have done horrible things to this country. But, you know, you look at someone like Chris Christie, who's just giving it to Trump. And I think he really is trying to save his party. I do not like Chris Christie at all, to be clear. But you have a few people in their neck out. But other than that, 
I think you're going to see Donald Trump become the primary candidate for the Republicans. I think he's going to lose. I think he might cost them. I think we're going to take back the House. And I think he might cost them the Senate. And let's be clear, our Senate map is hard. We have a hard job next year and it's difficult. But I, I see this light at the end of the tunnel because it's just craziness on their side. And I think that craziness is going to backfire. Okay, so let's look ahead. Um, You know, we've got a lot of messaging heading into 2024, and obviously different messaging works on different demographics. What have you found is the most effective message to turn out young voters, like Gen Zs like you and millennials like me? Yeah, well, obviously I always hesitate to speak for the whole generation, but I think what the numbers tell us is pretty simple. Like young people, this generation is the most progressive generation we've seen in the history of our country. Um, they want health care for everyone, you know, housing, ending gun violence, ensuring that money is going to our communities and we have equity in the system. And that gives me so much hope. You know, I remember I was on a March for I used to be the organizing director for March for Our Lives, the movement that came out of the shooting that happened in Parkland. And I remember I'm on a call, like explaining an event, someone unmuted. It's like one of our youngest volunteers. I think she was like 13, 12 and started asking me questions about how people with a specific disability would be able to access the event. Or if you didn't have a certain type of internet, how could you access? And I just remember thinking, I wasn't thinking like that at 13 and I'm Gen Z. And that gives me so much hope. And it's not about guilting people, right? It's not about making things harder for society, but it's about making things equitable for everybody. And this younger generation, most I speak with, they want everyone to do well. And, you know, we've, we've, the, our country has really grown up with this scarcity mindset because our country was birthed out of revolution. And when you come out of revolution like that, um, scarcity is a thing. When now we have abundance. And I think our country is in this tug of war with what kind of thought process do we want when we sit at the table to make decisions? Is it if I'm getting something, you must be losing something and vice versa, which is the scarcity mindset? Or is it we have enough for all of us to have what we need to live our life? And even though that might sound like a radical thing to say, it's not. And especially because I really believe that most of this generation is in line with that, even if they have different, you know, they're different on the ideological spectrum. And that gives me hope. So talking about the issues, not focusing on what we're against, but focusing on what we're for, talking about the bold solutions. I think that helps us win bold, progressive solutions. That's what gets young people excited. And look, you can always say it's going to take us time. But I want you to know this is the North Star. This is where I believe our country should be. And we're going to get there when we work together. And that mentality of it's yeah, I always tell people in my district, yes, I work for you. But more importantly, I work with you. And when you work with someone, it creates that uh, th- that team, uh, uh, the teamwork that you need to make the difference. And I think young people just want to be a part of the team. I think the scarcity mindset point is so important, and it especially presents itself in the student loan debt cancellation argument because Republicans are saying, well, they can't get uh, student loan debt even even with these predatory rates and even that it's even though it's kind of dragging down an entire generation. We don't want that to happen because we had to pay our loans. And like when you really think about it from a different perspective, it's like imagine what it'll be like if an entire generation of people is allowed to participate in the economy, is allowed to spend their money in restaurants and stores and on vacations and in hotels and and like, you know, uh, travel destinations. Like, doesn't that benefit everyone? Won't even the yeah. people who are complaining about this, won't they see some benefit when the economy uh, g- gets uh, gets such a such a boon to it by virtue of all these people in infusing their money into it. Like, doesn't that help the stock market? Won't that help your four hundred one k? Like, we have to think about this stuff from a different perspective. It's not always about this idea of like of like you know I, somebody else's gain is to my detriment, and I think uh, exactly. that's what's missing out of uh, out no, of. No, you're one hundred percent right. And the student loan debt. You know, I made this point on the floor um, a few months ago when we were voting on vetoing. Um, President Biden's action on it. Thank God that failed. Um, but the but the uh, what the point I made was this argument of because I paid mine off, you should have to do it too. It's just not how we legislate. Like, why would we use that logic on? You know, we cherry pick the issues they want to use that logic it's, on. It's basically we, saying keep things bad because I had it, to suffer, and so everybody else should too. It's exactly. Like if there's a cancer treatment 
uh, that just got released. It's like, well, I had to suffer through cancer. Suffer. So nobody else should be treated. Exactly. It's just not, it's not how we legislate. That's not the logic we use. If that was a lot, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be able to vote. Right. You know, and, and, and so either way, it's just, it's, it's, and we have to call it out for what it is. It's really a kind of bigoted logic that's really seep in the scarcity mindset. And in fact, when I said bigoted logic on the floor, Virginia Fox, you know, was working to have my words taken down. She was so offended about it, but it's true. You know, we, we want to talk about progress. How are we going to do better? And the case in student loan debt, but young, this young generations are in, are in debt, not because they live beyond their means, but because they've been denied the means to live. And we understand that the, the cancellation of student debt is a Band-Aid, of course, but but we're bleeding. <laughs> we need the Band-Aid. And then let's talk about how we create a society where we don't need to do as many Band-Aids. I agree. It's a lot of money for our government to shell out, but it is necessary and required in this moment. And then we talk about how we make sure we never need to take out that Band-Aid again. That's how progress works. Exactly. Uh, you're 26. Is that correct? Yes. In a body where I believe the average age is um, 102. I, I think that's the, I think that's the, the number that we're dealing with it, here. It might be 101. 100, 101. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what is it like being on the house floor? What's it like being in, in the gym there? Like what, I guess, what's it like being surrounded by colleagues who are so much older than you? Yeah. Well, I'm flattered. Do you think I go to the gym? So thank you. <laughs> um, I don't, but, but you know, um, on the house floor is interesting. And I will say, you know, I, I know I made the headlines as the first Gen Z member. This class, though, this Democratic class is the uh, most diverse Democratic class in modern history. It is also the youngest Democratic class in modern history. You know, a lot of my classmates are pretty close to my age, early 30s, uh, later 30s. I mean, if you're under your 50s in Congress, that is considered very young. If you're in your 30s in Congress, you're considered a, like a child. I'm considered like a fetus. So I'm, I'm like, I'm like the very, very young, but uh, either way, I have a lot of friends who are super young in Congress that, um, you know, we're building this movement of younger people getting elected. And there is a lot of solidarity with older folks too. I think oftentimes we like to look at things in a very binary way. If you're old, you're not advocating for young people. I've been pleasantly surprised with some of the older folks there who all they do is talk about the children and talk about future generations and they, they're in this fight with us too. So it really is a multiracial, cross-generational movement of people. Uh, we just need more. It's not that our numbers aren't there yet um, to pass the bold legislation that we need right right now. And I think we have a great opportunity to change that. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the, the older folks, I mean, Senator Markey, Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, like these aren't, uh, uh, you know, young bucks exactly but uh but yeah. obviously one of the most progressive or some of the most progressive members of uh, of, of the exactly. senate just onto themselves okay uh let's finish off with this the the what, what i think is the most important issue of uh, uh of the moment and that is uh barbie or oppenheimer <laughs> i just i saw barbie last night with my girlfriend um just in the theaters so i would say barbie i haven't seen oppenheimer yet but um you know I need to watch it soon. All right. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me on. 